So, uh, this is sort of the source strength. So, that is the flux. So, it it is like del C current at 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 x equal to 0 yes. So, you are saying that you want to vary this current. Huh, so, in one slide I had written. So, the thing is that uh, this is the correct formulation this is the current which is why at x equal to 0 also the concentration will rise with time. But if you are just interested in the exponential profile, you could just say that I will normalize everything by the value at 0, that could be different at different times, but whatever. Uh, so, if I normalize everything at 1 at x equal to 0, I would get things like you know, I would get sort of profiles which would evolve keeping this at 1. It is a different way of saying, but this is if you think about the physical process, this is the right equation to write down. There is a constant source at x equal to 0. You could say that well, I could vary the source strength, for example, that maybe more mRNA is being transcribed at some time and less at some other time. So, the source its strength itself varies, that would be a different, that would be an improvement on this model. But yeah, it is as far as I know, there is no experimental data on the same RNA sort of transcription rates as a function of time. So, people just take it to be constant. So, here so that was across different species, three different species. This is the same species, but uh, two embryos uh, one which has a largish embryo length simply because of random variations, and one which has a smaller embryo length. And again, you will see that the lengths the lambda sort of scale with the embryo length. So, a larger em so if you just plot x, so one embryo is around 500, the other is around 700. the lengths the lambdas are different which you can see. So, if you scale the x axis by the length of the embryo itself. So, it goes from 0 to 1 then the two curves fall on each other. So, they collapse on top of each other which basically tells you that this lambda again even within this single species this lambda is proportional to L ok. So, this Bicoid gradient forms um, it is an exponential gradient which we sort of understand in this context. It scales with the embryo length which we do not understand how it does that. Ok, but this is the first step to this sort of uh, to this developmental cascade that you get this matter this Bicoid uh, gradient the constant gradient profile of this Bicoid protein. What does that do next? Ok, this is very bad maybe I can show here. So, here is here is my Bicoid over here the top curve top figure is Bicoid it is the highest concentration at the anterior pole the lowest concentration at the posterior pole. These are different these are these three are different downstream proteins that are expressed once the Bicoid concentration has sort of set in. So, this is one protein called hunchback, this is one protein called giant, this is one protein called Krupal. And if you plot the intensities or the concentrations of this protein again along the AP axis, you will see that clearly there is a variation. So, this blue curve over here is the Bicoid right it has an exponential profile. The hunchback which is the red one over here is roughly constant until a certain level and then it drops down and becomes 0. The Krupal has a peak somewhere in in the middle of the embryo uh, this giant has sort of two peaks one here and one here. So, the idea is this that once you have set in this uh, Bicoid gradient all of these other proteins respond to the Bicoid gradient and express in a particular way. So, as to give these sort of spatial patterns ok. And then in response to these spatial patterns of these other downstream genes hunchback, giant, crupal, whatever you will get different parts of this fly body developing into different organs organs. Uh, some will be abdomen, some will be wings, some will be head and so on ok. There is this patterning cascade. So, this I am just showing a few there are of course, many other proteins and so on. It is a extremely complicated process, but this is the basic idea that once the Bicoid has set in that is the thing that controls all subsequent developmental processes and all other proteins respond to this Bicoid gradient level ok. So, for example, if you look at this. So, this is just the Bicoid 
gradient profile the two curves being from two sides of the eyebrow just as a consistently check if you draw a line along this the top half or you will draw a line along the bottom half you get roughly similar sort of con the red and the blue are the, that thing. So, that is my Bicoid concentration profile as a function of the A p axis along the A p axis. So, I will just talk about one of these proteins in particular which is this hunchback protein ok. So, if you plot the hunchback intensity against the Bicoid intensity what it shows is that there is some sort of a sigmoidal response and a very sharp sigmoidal response. When the Bicoid intensity is low the hunchback is low once the Bicoid intensity crosses some sort of a critical threshold the hunchback level sort of jumps up ok. So, you can imagine that when I have a Bicoid gradient like this and let us say the critical threshold is somewhere over here the hunchback can respond to this. So, on this side the Bicoid intensity is greater than the critical density. So, I will have a high hunchback on this side the Bicoid intensity is lower than this critical intensity. So, I will have a low hunchback profile and I will get a concentration which looks something like this. It is high on this anterior half, then it sort of falls sharply and it is low in the posterior half. How, how does how does this happen? How does this sort of control happen? So, that people have understood to a certain extent. What Bicoid does is that so, you have the fly DNA right. So, you have the fly genome which has all these base pairs. Let us say here is the gene that codes for hunchback starting from here ok. What Bicoid can do is that it can come and bind to these sites upstream of the hunchback gene and it regulates the transcription of this hunchback gene itself So, in particular it is known that Bicoid has 6 binding sites upstream of this hunchback gene. So, 6 Bicoid proteins can come and bind and once it binds the hunchback starts expressing so, you can think of this if you go back you can think of this in terms of the, the MWC remember the Monod Wyman Shangu sort of a model. So, in the states and weights of a, a sort of a thing that when this DNA is in the off state the Bicoid cannot bind and it has some particular weight let us say it has some energy E naught epsilon naught. In the on state uh, the Bicoids can come and bind and in particular there are 6 sort of binding sites. So, you can get any of these conformations no Bicoid bind bound 1 Bicoid bound 3 2 bound 3 bound till all 6 bound ok. And let us say this uh, on state where th this uh, DNA is accessible to the Bicoid that has some energy let us say epsilon on and then you can write down those weights corresponding to this state the off state or these on states. So, for example, if this is an energy epsilon off this is a weight e to the power of minus beta epsilon off um, if this has an energy epsilon on this on state it has as e to the power of minus beta epsilon on and then because there are 6 sites remember this was uh, the concentration went as if you remember k d sort of hill function of first order. So, k d plus c by sort of k d. So, 1 plus c by k d the concentration in this case being the concentration of picoid and k d being the resource equilibrium constant. And because there are 6 sites and if I assume that these 6 sites are sort of independent of each other. So, I do a z to the power of n sort of a thing. So, there is a power of 6. So, given this sort of a thing you can say that uh, what is then the probability to find this DNA in the on state what is the probability and therefore, the hunchback to be expressed and then that probability of being in the on state is just this divided by the whole partition function this on state plus the off state ok. So, this is just the kinetics part of it uh, that given a Bicoid concentration um, if I know that there is this sort of a 6 fold interaction of the Bicoid on this DNA maybe I can write an probability of being in the on state which depends on the Bicoid concentration. If on top of that you say that the well the Bicoid concentration I know from this SDD model is a function of position. So, the Bicoid has this exponential sort of a profile and I put that in over here what I will get is that I will get a profile for this hunchback protein itself assuming that the hunchback concentration is proportional to this on rate ok. So, I have this from the kinetics I have this Bicoid profile gradient profile from this SDD sort of a model it is an exponential profile if I put them both together I will get a profile for this hunchback protein itself ok. And how does that look? 
So, this is if I just put back plug back everything uh, I put in the Bicoid exponential profile. So, this is how my hunchback uh, profile looks like as a function of x, x being the distance along the b axis. How does this curve look like? So, for example, if I take an exponential profile for the Bicoid, this is what my hunch hunchback as a function of Bicoid concentration looks like, and if I so if I take this exponential profile here is how my hunchback profile looks like. So, it looks exactly like this sigmoidal function as we expect. The sharpness of the sigmoidal function depends on the fact that you have this uh, to the power of 6 sitting over here right. So, the higher this number the sharper that sort of sigmoidal curve will appear. So, this sort of a model which sort of built takes in this SDD model then this sort of a MWC model for the Bicoid interaction with the DNA then tells you how this hunchback profile will look like in response to this Bicoid concentration profile. And this is precisely well not precisely, but this is roughly what you see in experiments ok. It it gets even the transition region sort of correct in that uh, if you look at these experimental graphs this uh, hunchback actually falls uh, hunchback level falls very precisely at around the midpoint of the embryo. So, it falls exactly around 50 percent of the embryo. It does not uh, care what the embryo length is, what if you take a large embryo versus a small embryo the hunchback this transition will always happen very precisely at around 50 percent 49 point some percent actually. In fact, even that is a puzzle. So, for example, if you look at uh, uh, different embryos and you were to plot this Bicoid Bicoid concentration as a function of x, you get an exponential profile, let us say with some lambda equal to 100 microns on an average. So, different embryos, some will be 110, some will be 90, and so on. So, you will get a spread with a mean of around 100, let us say. But in all of these, somehow um, this regulatory cycle is such that if you look at the hunchback proof, if you look at the hunchback concentration, the hunchback will still precisely happen at 50 percent of the embryo length. So, there is some sort of an error correction built in the fly can very precisely regulate this domain boundary between the high hunchback and the low hunchback regions. And there is a lot of work in trying to explain how this high level of precision of the hunchback actually comes about. So, this is just for one of course, you can do this for uh, other proteins as well. In particular uh, all of these proteins uh, talk to one another. So, all this hunchback giant crupel they all have so, they all giant crupel bicoid. So, they all talk to each other and bicoid talks to every one of them. So, you have this very complicated network of chemical kinetics. So, this are chemical kinetics networks and on top of these these things can diffuse to form some sort of the gradients that you see. And there have been models like this which have actually done very well in explaining the observed gradients of all of these or many of these proteins simultaneously. So, this was for Drosophila. Let me now switch gears to a slightly more general model, which is to say that how do I if I have a complex network like this of chemical reactions and then I imagine that these species themselves are diffusing, how do I generally think about generically think about patterns that form ok. So, this was very simple case of a pattern a high low sort of a thing but you can have more complicated patterns that form and then how do I think about cases such as that. 